I'm just looking at the chat really quickly and um, what, what our format is, is that Jamie has posted um, a form and the form allows people to identify themselves as wanting to be speakers and also for people who would prefer not to speak but would like to comment to submit a written comment. All of our written comments will be um, distributed to the governing board um, as well as to our cabinet and um, then will also be available to all of the members of the committee that will be formed um, relatively quickly. Um, just a reminder that the applications do require that you attend one of these listening sessions. And so um, we were also thinking of recording one of the sessions so that if you wanted to apply and you were unable to attend, you would still have the opportunity to um, submit an application after you accessed the recording and um, reviewed it. The other thing is that um, my colleagues here, um, obviously I think most people know Jamie, um, she's, she's running um, our webinar and then our executive director of personnel, Deborah, Dr. Deborah Craddock is here and our associate superintendent of ed services, Ana East Wen is here. Um, we are taking notes and we will um, print those notes and also um, publish those on the website. So I think that we're working hard to be transparent. Um, and I know that people's schedules, especially at this time of year are really busy. So trying to make accommodations for people to um, access these listening sessions. So I know this is a time for us to listen and a time for me not to talk, um, but I wanna give you just a, a quick introduction to our diversity, equity and inclusion efforts. And then we will turn it over to the members of the community. Um, you'll have three minutes to speak. Um, and if you elect not to use those three minutes, we'll just continue on to our next speaker. Um, it went really, it worked really well um, on our Monday night session. So we anticipate that happening again. So I um, look forward to hearing all of the, the views and insights from our community. So I, I wanted to just give you this, the slightest background about our um, diversity and equity inclusion initiative. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is housed um, with the district under our student support and educational services departments. Um, as a district, I think that we are known and we are very committed to a robust and rigorous educational program. It's one of the hallmarks um, that we pride ourselves in. Um, but as um, time has gone on more recently, we have um, very much committed to our wellness initiative. And we've seen that with you know, a lot of professional development, training, student outreach, the establishment of our wellness center at La Cunada High School. And we've continued to expand that um, wellness initiative. It now includes social emotional learning and it is, is also the umbrella for our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. We want all of our environments at, on our campuses and in the virtual realm um, to be safe, to be supported, to represent students, um, and for students to feel that they are welcome and that they can be um, advocates um, in a safe environment for who they are and how they choose to express themselves in the world. Um, this isn't an initiative, however, that has just, you know, evolved over the, the past year or two. We have been doing this work, although not naming it as DEI, um, for the past 20 years. There is representative um, factors of, of this work in our developmental assets um, initiative that has permeated the district for the last 18 years. It, it is a very firm part of our challenge success work in our safety and security initiative, which was launched several years ago. Um, we were really um, focused on restorative justice. We also you know, were committed in that safety and security work to safe campuses, which does um, touch and outreach to diversity, equity, and inclusion. But you know, over the past couple of years, I need to acknowledge that we have seen some areas that have prompted um, concern and that have had us be more explicit about our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, for example, some poor fan behavior at our high school sporting events, um, inappropriate language on our campuses, um, which makes the campus feel unsafe um, and not inclusive. Um, we've had parent, family, staff, student interest in our increasing our outreach and the comprehensive nature of our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So over a year ago, um, we um, hired a consultant, Christina Hale Elliott, 
um, one of her chief responsibilities was to create for the district a strengths and needs assessment report. Um, she spent a year um, collecting data, doing interviews, focus groups, um, um, and she put together that strengths and needs assessment report, which was unveiled to the community this past August. Um, she also did extensive training with our governing board and with our leadership team, um, significant staff development, um, also many offerings on our family learning series. And I just want you to also know that we use other consultants. We have partnered extensively with the Anti-Defamation League and with the International Federation for Social Emotional Learning, all of which have had um, strong components in their consultancy work with the district on DEI. Um, where we are now is we are looking to create a three-year implementation plan. Uh, we will have a um, committee, a special committee that um, serves to make recommendations to staff to formulate this three-year implementation plan. That plan will be developed over the course of the next couple of months um, after the recommendations are received from our special committee. That committee will then turn into an oversight committee whereby staff will report to them two to three times a year about the progress re related to the goals, actions, and services um, to demonstrate that DEI work is happening and is firmly rooting itself within our district. So that is where we are. Um, there has been a concern or an interest from the community that we listen and that we get a sense of what the community feels about this is issue. And that is where we are today. So without further ado, we would like to listen and we will open it up for members of our community to share their insights related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Okay, everyone. So I've been posting a Google form in the chat. You'll see me repost throughout the webinar as I notice our attendee numbers change. I just want to make sure anybody joining us throughout the meeting has the link. So I apologize. You'll see it about 100 times in the next hour. Um, but just know that that's what I'm doing. And um, what I'll do is when it's your turn, I'll give you permission to speak and then you'll be able to come on. So up first, we have um, uh, Jim Ming. So let me find you on our list. And then next will be Patty. So I'll post in the chat so you have a heads up of when your turn is coming up. And then I'm gonna set a timer and you'll have three minutes. Thank you for joining us, Jiming. Um, you have the floor. Oh, okay. Um, first, I would like to suggest that celebrating Asian American Heritage Months uh, in the DEI agenda. I also noticed that there will be parents' resistance on DEI. I know some parents have biased a view on Black students and homeless students and think having them in the district will affect our school academic standing and decrease our property value. I think we need more education on the DEI for parents. Um, and then I also read the strengths and needs reports. It has many good insights that will help us address the needs for DEI. However, in the report, the teacher's perception on their attitude of DEI conflicts with the student's view on the teacher's DEI efforts. And I look at the survey, I notice there is a set of how comfortable are you questions and it's a bit leading. Uh, I think they can be replaced with another set of questions that can uncover the potential barriers of the DEI execution. I would be happy to discuss these with a survey designer. And that's all I want to say. Thank you so much. We appreciate your insights and your comments and um, hope you have a great day. Our next speaker, Jamie. Next is going to be Patty. Hi, Patty. Hi, Hi Patty. can you hear me? Yes, you can. Awesome. Thank okay, you. thank you. Um, so I actually attended the other uh, session as well, and this is my second one. Um, and I didn't speak then, but now I've prepared some statements. So hopefully uh, it might be more as a reaction of what I heard last time. Um, I'm a second generation Korean American who attended both LCE and high school. Um, when I went to college in 1993, uh, one of the first orientations that we had was um, what was appropriate language to use on campus. And actually it was led by 
peers. They were like 19 and 20 year old kids um, who told us flat out comments like you're so gay or homophobic comments and not welcome on campus. And in the four years that I was on campus, I never heard it used in a derogatory way because people remembered this orientation. I was shocked when I came back to La Cañada that that kids these days in 2020 were still using you're so gay as a derogatory comment that the N word would be thrown around. And I was disappointed to think and feel that maybe we had slid backwards in time instead of making progress. Um, the main point that I wanted to speak though was that I wanna encourage the district to pick people who actually believe that we need this initiative, that we need this committee. Um, there were a lot of people who spoke at the last session who were saying that they were afraid that they were gonna sacrifice academic excellence for DEI. And to me, that's code for just being anti-DEI. A lot of people were saying they're not mutually exclusive and I completely agree. They, go, they should and do go hand in hand. Um, and those who might be on the call who say that, uh, you know, we are sacrificing for academic excellence. I also wanna say that you know, places like Amherst, Yale, Swarthmore, Harvard, they all have DEI offices. Um, and if we don't get on this bandwagon, that we will harm our children because it does matter that we're on it. And academically, schools will look at this and realize that, that think that we are a backwards place instead of moving forward with the times. So I hope that the district will consider this when they're picking people and that instead of fighting the whys of it, that we'll get to fight for the hows. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Appreciate your feedback. Patty, I just want to make sure you know I accidentally hit the two minute timer. So you have another minute if you have anything else you wanted to add. I'm sorry if I'm stressing you with that. That's okay. You know what? I really was rushing in and I was like, oh my gosh, it's so much faster than I thought it would be. Um, yeah. You know, I think that the other thing is, you know, the committee, I know that that there has to be some sensitivity to um, that all voices are heard. Um, but to me, that message says, if you put anti-DEI people on that committee, that nothing will get done, that instead they will be arguing, why do we need this instead of how do we need to implement it? And, um, and I think really that's not something that committee has time for. So whoever's picking this needs to think carefully about who's on it and if really there's a commitment to moving this agenda forward or not. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Of course. Thanks, Eddie. All right, up next is Noel. Let me move you over. Thank you, Noel, for being here. The mic is yours. Thank you. Um, my name is Noel Burnett. We are actually uh, new to La Cañada this year. Um, we moved up here from Pasadena, where private schools before. Um, so this is our, our first go here at um, at LCUSD. Um, I am really concerned with this initiative. I think that diversity, equity, and inclusion, it just, it sounds great um, and nobody should be left out and we're all created equal, but I think, you know, it's, it's an agreeable idea. We want to foster closeness in our community, but I think that this issue has become so polarizing. Um, if you dive deep into Ms. Hale Elliott's report, you can, you'll notice that her entire citation and resource list are from openly socialist and Marxist um, people, which I don't think any one of us as Americans want to, to have our kids being taught um, those kinds of things. This is this is America. Um, the second thing is, I was on Tuesday's call as well, and I heard a couple people say, "Well, you know, I I really want to have my my kids who are you know half African American and half Hispanic to see more teachers that look like them." And my concern with comments like that is that. If our number one priority is our kids and their education, then the number one priority should be to hire the most qualified people, not hiring people based on what they look like. That to me is counterproductive to what this entire initiative is supposed to be, is supposed to be equal. It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that you know you should just hire someone based on what they look like. It's qualifications that matter. And if the entire teaching population 
is of one race, whether it be Asian or black or whatever it is, it shouldn't matter. What should matter is that we have the best qualified person for the job. And Thank that's... you, Will. Appreciate you taking the time to join us and provide your feedback. And I see that we have Kim next, Jamie. Welcome, Kim. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you for doing this. I submitted a statement at the last listening session. Uh, it wasn't read, but I don't want to waste time reading it now because I have a few questions. And I think in just knowing the format, I'm just going to throw them out because clearly we're not answering them, but I'll submit them just thoughts, you know, for the governing board and then the ultimate committee. Um, and also Jamie said that it'll, my prior questions will be shared uh, with the governing board and the committee, my prior statement. Thank so my questions, I have five. I believe they're actually interrelated. Number one, uh, what would be the ideal makeup of the committee? And I think sort of Noel and, and what Patty was saying, it goes along with that. Number two, will those who do not support the mission that you're trying to accomplish be admitted to the committee? And if so, I, it, the question is, what would be the rationale for that? Number three, will the committee have members with some degree of expertise in the areas it will focus on, namely diversity, equity, and inclusion, either from an educational standpoint or through their work or volunteerism or public service? And I think that goes to what Noelle was talking about, sort of some of the things that she was saying. You know, will people be able to answer those questions for her about, you know, diversity for the sake of diversity and why is it important and quality versus diversity? Uh, number four, is based on a quote from an acquaintance who's worked in HR for, I believe, a couple of decades. The quote, one can argue that the people who are responsible, however unintentional, for creating a problem cannot be the stakeholders in fixing the problem. At a minimum, they cannot be the only stakeholders, and they certainly cannot lead the effort. So the question is, you know, do we as a district, governing board, school district, agree with this? And if so, uh, you know, I wonder what the rationale of having a committee of community members lead uh, the initiative is and uh, without the guidance support and support of an outside professional. And then I hope that makes sense. And then number five, uh, we now have two new board members, both stated during multiple interviews that they believe that Christine Hill, Christina Hill Elliott or another qualified consultant uh, should be engaged this school year to lead and guide the district's initiative. Once they are on the board and have started their terms, will the way that we are choosing to proceed now be reevaluated? And, um, and those are my only questions. But again, throw them out there in the universe because uh, I, I know that you're just listening. Thank you, Kim. And I will submit them. Okay. Okay, great. We appreciate the questions. I think they're, they're very um, well-crafted and, and ones that we will answer. You're right, we are just listening, but I really appreciate you being so attentive to detail and presenting these questions. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Octavia Thuss. Welcome, yeah. Octavia. Ah, uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for hosting these. I really appreciate it. Um, I really first want to acknowledge that I know that COVID and reopening is very much on your mind and the pressures from the community. So I really am incredibly grateful that DEI remains a viable topic. <laughs> I know it is because it's in your goals. So much, much appreciated. Um, my concern is the resistance within the community. And while there is resistance in the community to the work of DEI, um, it's evident LCUSD must move forward and address issues of DEI. And the related issues I focus on are the legal compliance. As long as there's a complaint of harassment and if there is no remedy, LCUSD has a compliance problem. Um, a school that fails to respond appropriately to harassment um, especially those of protected classes, we could be in violation of law, such as Title IV and Title VI of the Civil Rights Acts of 64, Title IX of the Education Amendments of 72, Section 504 Re Rehabilitation Act of 73, Titles II and III of the American with Disabilities Act, and of course, IDEA, which was originally the public law 94-142, yeah, 142. Personal experiences, um, I, as early as third grade, one of my children was called homophobic slurs on multiple occasions, um, called fag and gay, couldn't go to Disneyland because they were gay, et cetera, et cetera. Completely unacceptable. And while the school did try, 
truly the tools are not there yet. Um, the teachers want the tools, they want the training, they want to know how to deal better with these instances of bullying, harassment. And I've heard this from my teacher friends. And I was a teacher once too, and I know what it's like to be in a job and really realize at one point, oh my goodness, I don't think I have the right training for this. Um, repeated harassment and bullying leads to absenteeism. And we've experienced this in our own family for sure. And absenteeism can and does for some lead to learning loss. And this is of huge concern. And I know it should be a concern. I know it is a concern for the district, but I really want to make a point of this that there are an awful lot of kids who just can't deal with going to school. And I had one of those kids for a couple of years and it was really frustrating. Um, things have changed through our parenting, through our efforts and through help with school, but more needs to be done. Um, and we're lucky, we're one of the lucky ones. Um, Longer term unaddressed harassment and bullying can lead to more serious issues of substance abuse and personal harm, sometimes even suicide. And I can't tell you how much as a parent, I was scared. I was genuinely scared um, with a small child being so unhappy and so at, un at ease with school. I think my time's running out. Did I get a two minute or a three minute? <laughs> Anyways, hope you choose a committee with a number of people who want DEI work and aren't resistant. And I appreciate your time. Thank you, Octavia. Appreciate you coming and, and sharing with us. Jamie, our, our next speaker. Yeah, up next is Ryan. Moving him over right now, Ryan Chen. Thank you. So Ryan, thank you. You're yep. our next speaker. Glad you're here. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm Ryan Chen. Um, I've been in La Cunada since my son was uh, was uh, uh, in kindergarten. Uh, that's when we moved here, um, obviously for school reasons, right? <laughs> like much of everyone else. So I guess what I like to say is, you know, the I think one of the reasons why this thing has become so polarizing in the community is really about what exactly is defined as DEI, right? So, you know, I, I found what both Patty and Noel was saying was fascinating because if you take what Patty was saying, you know, we educate our kids to respect each other, to understand each other, appreciate each other's cultures. I mean, that is absolutely fantastic, right? Nobody would have a problem with that. And I think the, the community as a whole would certainly embrace that because that's what, you know, a small community is all about, right? Really respect each other and care for each other. However, you know, there are elements of the DEI proposal. I mean, unfortunately, I did not read it, read the whole thing, but I have heard and I've heard other people speak on it is very extreme and is not really about what we're talking about here. Right. I mean, we're trying, we want to stop harassment. We want to make people feel comfortable. That's all great. But some of the extreme elements have really nothing to do with that. So I, I think you know, that part of it is really needs to be looked upon by the committee to really understand what exactly are we teaching our kids by those extreme elements. Like there's some authors like, um, you know, that talks about socialists. I think one of, one of the authors wrote a book about capitalism is essentially racist. Um, so, you know, those are the elements where I don't think it's appropriate for our kids, but there are elements of DEI I think is tremendous and we absolutely need it, which is, you know, <clears throat> make sure we all understand each other's differences and respect each other and treat everyone equally. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. We appreciate you taking the time to share with us. Jamie, our next speaker. Uh, Hi, next Jamie. is going to be Trina. Hi, Trina. Thank you for sharing your, you can unmute yourself and speak. And the, you unmute on the bottom left hand. There, right. there you go. Okay. Can you hear me? Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I, I agree with many of the other comments in support of DEI. So I would like to spend my time speaking specifically about the kids. You know, late this summer, uh, another parent brought to my attention the various Instagram posts. I, when I first came upon them in probably early August, I read 
them until about two o'clock in the morning. I was intermittently heartbroken, in tears, angry, horrified, disgusted, and I and worse yet, I understood the experience my child was having. My child is an excellent student that loves school and suddenly was shutting down. And now I know why. I asked, is this what you see? The answer was yes, every day. And no one does anything about it. So the other comments I heard from other children were very similar. I, I couldn't believe that to many children, this has become normalized. They think that this is actually somewhat normal behavior because adults are present and nothing happens. It was interesting, some of them were commenting how there was more punishment for forgetting your gym locker, your lock on your locker, that the teacher spent days going over what the punishment would be if you forget your gym locker and that you actually would get detention, but somebody shouting the N-word or gay slurs or other epithets against students or drawing a swastika on the desk didn't result in any demonstrable correction. No detention, no phone calls, no, no assembly, no this. Even after Ms. Hill Elliott's assembly, students shouted racial and homophobic epithets in the hallways and nothing was done. It's unbelievable. So, and then to add to that, the students, in my opinion, have been crying out for adults to act. And instead of, I, I don't mean to demonize you, I realize you're doing this because you do want to act. I am talking about those who responded as if, as if there was something, you know, this is political, this is this. It's, it's like, no, this is ridiculous. This type of behavior is not tolerated in any public setting, in your work setting, in your office, in the grocery store. It's unacceptable. What are we teaching our children? This is not what is, is allowed in my home. And I would hope that the school will make a drastic change. Thank you. Thank you, Trina, for sharing. We appreciate your comments. Um, it looks like our next speaker is Jill Panosian. Jill, welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks to everybody here for hosting these sessions. This has been, uh, you know, just so far listening to the speakers, this has been really educational and I really do appreciate this. Um, I'm here from the bottom of my heart because I want to learn more about what DEI really means. We've heard the rumors. We've read all the things. We've, you know, Wendy, I know we've read your statements and the outlook and at the school board meetings and, um, you know, all of the reassurances from you that this is not a political endeavor. And I, I, I am, I'm just, I'm wearing my heart on my sleeve here from what I see and from what a lot of us parents see right now is that this really does feel like some kind of political push into our schools. Um, I'm fourth generation Armenian American. Uh, my great grandparents were spit on and cursed at and you name it, you know, called the everything when they came to this country. So it's like, I have the stories as so many of us here in this community do about racial uh, you know, inequality. But right now, based on what me and a lot of us parents are seeing on the LCUSD website, there's articles on the site like classrooms are political, the New York Times 1619 project, you know, you, you guys have posted posted works by Eber McKendy. These are all very, very, very radical ideas and philosophies that we're frankly really concerned about. Um, classrooms should not be political. We wanna know, does the district plan on pushing these kinds of narratives into our school curriculum? I personally am very wary of that. I'm very skeptical of that. Um, the term that doesn't make sense to me the most is equity. We, whether or not, however we slice it, equity is a very politically charged concept. I don't think it has place in our schools. I think kids need to be held accountable for any kind of behavior that harasses or marginalizes any kind of a student. Lack of respect for anyone is 
it's you it's it, you cannot dismiss that it has to be I, I i'm a fan of zero tolerance policy you harass someone you say something to marginalize someone you're suspended you're expelled do what you have to do that's all i'm going to say about that right now but when it comes to oh, i got 40 seconds left left i feel like i'm on tv okay 40 seconds left diversity and inclusion when it comes to diversity and inclusion Obviously, we all want that, but um, particularly, I think right now, we also need to focus on diversity of thought and inclusion of all opinions, because right now I can tell you from personal firsthand experience, there are countless kids elementary through high school who are scared to express themselves freely for fear of being attacked because they don't want to take off a teacher because they might have a conservative point of view. They might have a question that really questions, um, you know, a one world view. And that's what we need to protect when it comes to inclusion. Seven seconds left. Um, we're just concerned about how much of what is politically charged right now will be injected into our curriculum. Thank you, Joe. We appreciate you taking the time to share. Um, next we have um, Ahi, welcome. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Ahi and I have two kids in the district, um, both in elementary school. And we moved to La Cañada about five years ago. And as much as we love it here, I realized that we live in a bubble. And while this means a quiet neighborhood, good schools, a low risk of doing harmful things, on the flip side, it brings up the question of if our kids are ready for the real world. And I'm not saying that our district should have the onus on them to expose our kids to everything out there. We certainly cannot do that, but I think we can um, do our part to create a healthier social environment for our kids to thrive in. And I think the formulation of the DI plan is a great start. So I'm very, very happy that our district is pursuing this. And I think there are many ways to roll out this uh, DEI plan, but I hope that we can incorporate programs that could promote diversity and for something that are for our kids to develop cultural empathy. So whether it's through introducing a level of ethnic studies or creating social platforms where students can have candid discussions and gain unbiased perspectives. Um, but while we develop the DI implementation plan, I think it's also important to acknowledge that our students are not yet adults and that they may filter these new experiences or even new material or curriculum through very immature lenses. So I'm not sure if the district is planning to hire a consultant, but I think an expert who could provide guidance through this process and help set parameters will be very critical to the success of this plan. Uh, with that said, I'm very optimistic that we can expand the bubble that we live in while preserving all the qualities that make our district great. And I look forward to my own elementary school kids progressing through the district without ever having to feel marginalized or insecure because they are a minority. And I also hope that eventually that our district can gain the reputation of not only excelling in academics, but also for producing well-rounded model citizens in and beyond La Cañada. And that's it for me. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. And I hope that I can be part of this discussion going forward. Thank you, Aki. We really appreciate you taking the time and sharing. Thank you. Well, and next we have Belinda. Hi, Belinda. Thank you for being here. Okay. So we'll transition to Belinda. Thank you. Hi, this is Belinda. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about is hiring the best applicants. Of course, we wanna hire the best applicants, but I think that means that our HR department should be reaching out to all races and then pick the best applicants from the ones they, that apply. And I think HR can stop their practice of reaching out to friends of our current teachers. And that may result in not being the most qualified applicants. Um, the other point I want to go to is the fact that I have personally heard homophobic slurs loudly on campus um, and um, very loudly shouted from balconies and many um, of the, um, let me try and phrase that better, many um, other people must have heard that, those comments and yet nothing was done. Um, and that, that's a problem. And I think that if I can hear homophobic comments while I'm walking on campus, that means I absolutely believe every person of color that's heard similar slurs that are racially motivated or disability motivated or any other kind of slur. And those also 
were not acted upon. My own son, of course, saw a swastiska in the restroom in seventh or eighth grade. And I just want to kind of go back to Trina. I've never met Trina. I think I like her. And what her son said, I want to repeat three times, and no one does anything about it. And no one does anything about it. And no one does anything about it. I think we should record what Trina said and we should share it with our entire community because that is the problem. We have board policies. We have administrative regulations that should have protected Trina's son and all the kids. And they were not enforced over the years. Our staff members need to step up and create a school environment that's safe and conducive for learning for all students. And perhaps we need to start disciplining our staff members that refuse to do their job and refuse to follow the administrative regulations that are already present for them. I think that would go a long way for making an environment that's safe for Trina's son and for my son and for every other kid in, I should add in daughters, um, every student in our district. Because if we don't have our staff members attempting to discipline the students actually stepping in then we are doing nothing to protect our kids and all of our existing policies were pointless. So what's the point of even addressing new policies? That's all I have to say. Thank you, Belinda. I appreciate you taking the time again to share. Um, next, it looks like we have Jean. Jean, welcome. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I just wanted to, I wasn't planning on speaking today, but just hearing what people are saying, um, I am, fully pro DEI. I don't have, I'm white. I have two academically successful kids who have never complained about bullying, have never um, had even sort of issues in terms of like equity, ac you know, academically sort of getting the help that they need. They've gotten the help that they've needed if they've needed it. Um, and I just want to say that as a white La Cunada, uh resident, I want my kids to be in a school district that is addressing DEI issues. I want them to have be exposed to other viewpoints, to other perspectives. I want them, their peers who are minorities to uh, feel like they belong in their school environment. I sort of want, I don't believe that, um, literature recommended by the consultant is socialist and Marxist and that the, um, the educators of the La Cunada School District are going to inject political uh, you know, purposes into their teaching in order to convert our children into socialists and Marxists. Like, I just think that that's ridiculous. I understand that a conservative viewpoint should be heard as well as every other viewpoint, um, but that's the point is all the viewpoints should be heard. And um, so I just, I just want to express that people like me who are very satisfied with the experience their kids have had in school uh, can think that this would only make things better. This initiative would only make things better. And I also agree with what Patty said, where you shouldn't have people who are going to throw wrenches in the works um, on the committee. Um, and I'd like to nominate Ahi for the committee because I really liked her comments. <laughs> and that's thank all. you. Thank you, Jean. We appreciate you taking the time and sharing your views. Be well, Jamie. Who do we have next? Um, next is Lori, and um, Lori's got a older device, so I'm going to move her over to panelists so she'll be able to participate. So give me one second. Sure. Thank you. There we okay. Go. Hi, Lori. Lori, you need to unmute yourself. Thank there you. you. Um, it's obvious that our district has work to do. Um, and I'm glad that there's a focus on making, um, trying to make everyone feel welcome in our district. And I hope that it continues and I'm sure that it will. Um, I just want to say that we need to make sure that everyone is has as much as possible has the, the right learning environment, um, regardless of disability and race. Um, it should also include the diversity of viewpoints and people shouldn't be bullied for thinking differently. And I think that that's something that our, our community 
has um, is experiencing like there's a real issue with uh, uh, people being able to handle different viewpoints, especially when you look at the Block and Yada Facebook page. It it's changed in the last um, couple of years, and it's had a pretty negative impact on our community. I think. Um, so I think that we should um, embrace trying to help the students learn how to behave in a better way and also pay, realize that parents can do everything they can to try to um, protect and, and guide their children into being like good people. But we're also um, in, in a culture that we don't have control over everything that they do and say, and we don't always have control over the way they interact at school. And um, if the teachers have the right training and are equipped to handle those situations that come up, um, I think that it will improve. I, I, I've ha had three children go through the um, education program at, at La Cunada Unified, and um, it's been a, an overall very positive experience for our family. And I, I just want to um, say that I, I hope that we try to avoid teaching um, political viewpoints and, and um, try to focus on what brings us together as opposed to um, what separates us and, and hurts people's feelings. Great. Thank you so much, Lori. Appreciate you joining us. Nice to see you. Thank you. Too. Be well. Thank you. All right, up next is Starlin. Thank you. Find her on the list. So welcome, Starlin. Thank welcome. you for being here. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Stick my camera. Um, I just wanted to add, hi, Dr. Craddock. Um, We've been at the school in the district since 2009. Our oldest, who's 26, has graduated in 2012. We still have three, at, well, one's now at the high school, two's at PCY. And we've had ups and downs, but the most heartbreaking was in 2018 when my children are biracial, um, when a student told my youngest son that she didn't want to work with him because of his black skin, which if you've seen Julian, it's not even about what he looks like. It's just for my child to have to hear that and for us to have to even talk with him about that it was just heartbreaking. But what made it even worse was then when we go to the principal and the parents of this student, we get excuses about, oh, my kid was watching YouTube. We are advocating and begging, let's educate these kids. Let's have a talk about it. Let's, let's get this out here because this shouldn't be being said to students and it's all hushed up and kept under the rug and well we, we'll just talk to the class but it no one wanted to really talk about it so we had to email my son's parents the students of my son that this happened to their parents and let them know what was going on we had to fight for two months to get our child removed from the class with this student because the if you're gonna blame YouTube on the, why your kid is saying something like this to another student, then you're not getting it. And so I'm not for the political stuff. I love volunteering at the schools. I love helping. We are for everyone because like I said, we're a mixed race family. So there's, it's not being taught with us. So, I just want the education out there and, the, and to own it. And I don't want to have to fight to get my child removed from the student. That's the only thing that has been done is now every school year, we have to remind 
please don't put Julian with this student. And I just think that that's not acceptable. It should be talked about and shared that you can't, you shouldn't in this day and age be discriminating because of someone's skin or if someone is autistic, ADHD, just any of that. So I wanna help educate and talk. I don't want any political stuff and just get it out there. Okay, thank you for sharing. We appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Bye. And I see we have our next speaker is Emily Woods. Hi, Emily, welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you for hosting this today. Um, so I'm listening to everyone speak and I'm agreeing um, with a lot of the comments that are being made across the board. Um, I think, you know, Patty's, Patty's uh, statement about students being um, educated about uh, tolerance and inclusion um, is, is key. Obviously, diversity and inclusion are a part of our world. Um, but I also agree with Ryan and Noel and Jill about the equity component. Um, it concerns me that in the world of education, often we see these huge pendulum swings, um, whether it be you no know, child left behind that then led to this culture of teach to the test, memorize and regurgitate facts. We're now swinging back to more critical thinking um, and analysis in our classrooms, but it's taken a long time to get there. Um, so again, with the equity, we have San Diego Unified School District that is now changing the entire way in which they grade students and, and test students all based on equity. We watched the failed experiment that was UC Santa Cruz with no grades and how that impacted those graduates for years to come when they wanted to apply to graduate school programs and they were scrambling for written assessments by their professors. Um, I just fear that they're there's a, a chance that um, it can be taken too far. Uh, this also ties into the resources that are listed under the, the DEI resources on the district website. Um, I, I think Ryan is correct that many of them are viewed as radical and um, they are concerning, particularly Kendi, you have him listed multiple times, resources, articles, et cetera. And he had the most hate-filled tweet about now Justice Barrett, but at the time she was being considered for the Supreme Court about her, you know, as a white colonizer. And um, it, it was just awful and horrendous. And I, I don't even want to read it, but I ask you to please look it up. So why do we have that hateful individual listed as a resource on our school website? I, I really think you need to look at those resources and call it and make sure that um, it does include other thoughts. Um, in my last 20 seconds, I would just say, please do not create a rubber stamp yes committee. You need to have diverse thoughts. You need to have dialogue and discussion and healthy, respectful debate. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Appreciate your comments. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Up, up next is going to be Shanti. Hi, Shanti. Thank you for coming out. Well, this, this has been a fun journey for the last couple of years since I started talking with you about it. Um, so when I was in fourth grade, the other kids told me to go back to the jungle, called me mudskin. Um, this was clearly a chip I still have on my shoulder uh, 40 years later. And when I heard about what happened to Julian, uh, I, I was really uh, personally upset. So even though my kids are not being picked on. Uh, I see this as something that this district really should get on top of. And when I talked to all the other teachers at our school, they said, you know, we don't really have anything to, to help with. We don't, we, we don't feel safe talking to the students about conflict and race and prejudice. And I thought, well, that is something that needs to change. I think that's one of Christina's um, 
recommendations, right, is, is we need a system to protect and empower our teachers so they are able to do what needs to be done. Now, we have in only a handful of, of Black kids in our school, but we, we have a very diverse group of kids. And there are many minority groups uh, who are telling us that they are being bullied in school. And I believe that we want to include these people as first class citizens in La Cañada. That's, that's what attracts me to the school community is that we want to bring all these ideas together. Now, we could make it a punishment issue that if you say a racial slur in school, you get detention. But you know, this is the other fourth grade kids who were picking on me weren't doing it because they hated me. Their parents weren't teaching them that at home. It was just, that's what kids do. Uh, exploring ideas and power and bullying. You know, it's a natural part of behavior. It's completely predictable. And we as a school district can expect this to happen. Uh, and we all need, but we, and we can prepare for it by educating ourselves and educating our students, like with the orientation of what to expect and, and teaching our kids how to talk to each other. So um, I also hear there are a lot of parents who are afraid of socialism or other ideas. You know, I think Christine has picked out a few books. We don't need to call those specific ones as gospel. Uh, furthermore, my father is a Chicago economist. We are the most capitalist family there is. Uh, we are not the least bit worried. Uh, and in fact, I uh, think it's probably appropriate to introduce students to um, other philosophies because it's better to do that in a controlled setting than to throw them out in the world because there's a lot of fringe groups that are out recruiting young adults uh, with Marxist Leninist philosophy that if you haven't seen it before, you can fall uh, into it. Thank you, Shanti. Appreciate you coming out and taking the time with us. All right, um, Leanne, I have you next on the list, but I don't see you as an attendee anymore. So I'm going to move Katie over. But Leanne, if you're here, raise your hand if you just have a different name on the screen over what I'm seeing on the Google form, please. Thanks, Katie, for being here. It's your turn to talk. Okay, can you guys all hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, so first I'd just like to emphasize Patty and Octavia's previous points about um, selecting candidates for uh, the DEI special committee who actually believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, the alternative is filling a committee with those who are either lukewarm to the concept of inclusion or, or flagrantly against it, right? Which would, uh, I think, be essentially useless and just facilitate more of a roadblock than a coherent path towards good and necessary improvement. Um, I graduated from walking out of high school in 2015. I'm 23 now. I am white passing, cis passing, um, and to some extent straight passing. In spite of this, the high school never felt safe to me in the slightest. And so I can only imagine what it might have felt like for my contemporaries of color. Uh, at various times throughout my educational career, I raised complaints against the various faculty members and then escalated those concerns through the existing administration. Uh, slurs were rampant when I was enrolled there. In one instance uh, that stands out to me in a physical education course, various students, including my friends and I, were being attacked with slurs like gay and fag. Uh, as a lesbian myself, I was immediately appalled. I asked the teacher to at the very least talk to the offending students and he declined. Um, I escalated the issue to the school counselor who responded that the teacher was, and I quote, Mormon and so could not be expected to take a stance. Uh, the absurdity of this statement aside, um, this behavior was essentially the norm. Uh, instructors are apathetic on the subject of racialized comments. Some even refuse to hang up uh, this room as a safe space posters uh, that my friends and I had made to help foster an inclusion and an inclusive environment um, because the administration was not helping on that front. Uh, when I got to college and would explain my high school experience to others my age, they were appalled that a school in the vicinity of Los Angeles could be so backwards. Um, very briefly, I wanted to address a few comments that previous individuals had brought up. The concern with socialism and Marxism is uh, utterly absurd, to be blunt. An argument so blatantly ridiculous can only be construed by rational human beings as a subtle attempt to obfuscate the speaker's own latent racism. Capitalism is an inherently racist economic structure. Let's not forget the history of capitalism is indelibly intertwined um, with the ideological justification for colonial war, imperialism, and slavery. Uh, in any case, it is important, as the previous speaker was um, explaining, to expose developing minds to a plethora of um, philosophical and ideological um, experiences. When we insinuate that DEI is somehow un-American, we cannot be uh, being more over in our alliance of America with whiteness, which is insidious in itself, right? 
um, on the subject of classrooms not being political, whether we like it or not, classrooms have been forced to become political because the current administration has made it political to exist as a marginalized community. It is a political act in a fascist, fascist and racist country, which we are, to be gay, to be a person of color, to be an immigrant. Um, academic excellence is dependent upon DEI. There is no excellence to speak of in any educational system uh, if students feel unsafe or inferior. I would like to remind all of you, closing really quickly, that um, systems of oppression are intersecting. More simply, this means that what keeps one subject of the population of oppressed or down keeps us all down. So that's all. Thank you, Katie, for sharing your views. Appreciate it. Um, next, we have Wei. Hi, this is Wei. Yeah. Thank Thanks. You. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for organizing this meeting. Um, my family moving to La Cañada about 11 years ago, and we have a senior boy in La Cañada High and also a fifth grader in LCE. So essentially, my kids grew up here. Um, I currently work in a large bank and serve in a DIAG group, which is similar to our DEI committee. So I would like to share a little bit of our discussion in that meeting today, which is about celebration for November. So for November, we will celebrate Diwali, which is a large festival in India. And then the question comes, do we celebrate Thanksgiving too? And we all agree that it's an important festival for the United States, and it's a big group of our coworkers are celebrating for their family union um, to express their appreciation. So we say definitely we want to celebrate this too. And that reminds me of a, well, rejection of the LCE Thanksgiving event. Actually, I myself immigrated to the States about 20 years ago for my PhD study. And we are not that familiar with this culture when my kids were, were young. And when myself was in fifth grade in LCE, I volunteer in the Thanksgiving event. And it's so impressive to see like kids and parents from different cultural backgrounds to celebrate together. And the kids wrote notes to say, um, thank you for my parents for the warm food. Thank you to my teacher. Thanks for the life, everything good in the life. So I think this like school event is really good opportunity to teach our kids about the difference, about the appreciation, about respecting. So if else, if DEI is to reject these kind of events. I would seriously think, is it too polarized there? Yeah, that's that's my a little bit thoughts on this. I think we were really serious about like what's the implication of DEI. Although we we know that we want this, but we hope a clear definition and interpretation there. And we do know that dialogue will help to for us to better understand this. Thanks. Thank you, Wei. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. Um, Jamie, I know that you have um, asked people to submit in writing because we're going to narrow down to a few final speakers. And who do we have next? Uh, next, we have Christy. This will be our final speaker. Thank you. Hi, Christy. Thank you for being here. Christy, I just need you to unmute, please. Hold on, let me, she might need her second account. There we go. Let's see if that works. Christy, are you there? Meeting adjourned? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Hi, Christy. Do we have you on both accounts. Can you hear us? You're unmuted on one. Okay, I don't think, okay. I don't see you coming through. Can, I now, I, can you hear us? Jamie, any thoughts? No, Christy, if you can hear us, just um, please submit your um, comments on written form. Sorry, the tech's not working for you. We can We can see you, but we can't. We can see your account, but we can't hear anything. Okay. 
Anyone else in the queue, Jamie? Christy, sorry that we couldn't hear you. Yeah, there's about 10 more. So I, I'm encouraging all of them to submit written comments and we're now at 12.01. All right, well, we appreciate, um, I know the hour goes quickly, um, but I think that we, we listened and we heard quite a bit. Um, we appreciate everybody sharing. Um, it, it can feel sometimes um, difficult to share on, on um, you know, topics like these. I think it's important though, as a community to come together and share viewpoints. And it's really important for your district to stay informed so that we can move forward. Um, please, if you didn't have the opportunity to um, share, your, your viewpoint is extremely valuable. Um, we do encourage you to submit written comment. As I shared, all of those comments will be included in the notes and they will be shared with the governing board, with district staff, and then with the, um, the committee members um, that we name um, relatively soon. So thank you very much. Um, appreciate this because um, your voice matters. Um, we, and spending an hour with you was, was very informative, um, very appreciated. And to my colleagues on the screen, thank you all so much for taking the time to join me. Um, be well, um, take care. Please maintain social distance and wear your masks so that we can continue to um, move towards our, our schools reopening. And this along um, with our DEI work are critical and important issues for the district. So take care and goodbye.